This hearing of the Senate Appropriations Committee will please come to order. We are here today to discuss the national security components of the President's supplemental funding request. Very glad to have Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken with us to talk about the challenges we are seeing around the world and the urgency of providing the necessary resources to meet these challenges, support our allies, and make the world and our country safer. At our first full committee hearing earlier this year on outcompeting China, both secretaries made a strong case for why passing our full year appropriations bills with robust investments in America and avoiding perpetual CRs and devastating cuts is so crucial to keeping our nation competitive on the world stage. As the two of you return to this committee, I think every member on this dais understands and takes to heart many of the messages you left with us at the last hearing. These are unprecedented and difficult times, and American leadership and support will be critical as we face the many threats and challenges we will discuss today. That's why Congress must come together in a bipartisan fashion to act decisively and purposely. This is not a time to punt American leadership or punt on funding agencies critical to these efforts and to American families. If we let politics and division drive us away from this mission, I worry about where we will stand for years to come. So I hope this committee can continue to lead the way with thoughtful, swift, bipartisan action that keeps your message here today in mind. Thank you bo both for joining us again. We are at a precarious moment across the globe. Ukraine is continuing its courageous resistance against Putin's bloody invasion. And Israel is reeling from a horrific terrorist attack by Hamas a vicious attack that none of us will ever forget. Now it is often the innocent that suffer most in war. So of course there are also urgent humanitarian needs, including aid for the Ukrainian people and the countries caring for those displaced by Putin's war and aid for Palestinian civilians in Gaza. It is also a humanitarian imperative that Hamas release the hostages it took during its violent attack. And of course, Putin's invasion has also severely disrupted food supply chains around the world, leaving a serious crisis of global hunger in its wake. And in the Indo-Pacific, our friends and partners face growing threats and aggression, particularly from the Chinese government. In short, the world is on edge, and how the U.S. wields its leadership will be a critical factor in determining what happens next. Now is a time for serious, sober discussion, not partisanship or political show. This hearing is a crucial opportunity for us to make sure we are taking a full view of this moment, meeting immediate requirements while planning for the long term, and providing the resources necessary to make the world safer for America and its allies. If we are going to get this right, we have to understand how these conflicts are developing today and what our strategy is for the future. We have to appreciate the nuances that differentiate each of these challenges as well as the ways in which they are all interconnected. We have to see the big picture without losing sight of the human reality on the ground. The fact that in the middle of every conflict are civilians, residents displaced from their homes, hostages torn from their families, people facing obstacles getting basic medical services, and kids and families who desperately need food and water. And we have to be able to recognize the complexity of these issues while holding fast to the simple, actionable truths that can guide our work. For me, that means America must stand strong by our allies. Dictators cannot be allowed to invade sovereign democracies. Terrorism cannot be tolerated. And we cannot ignore the humanity and the cries for help from civilians who are caught in the middle of conflict and crossfire who we must protect. It's a tall order, but the Biden administration's national security supplemental request offers us a useful blueprint. And Vice Chair Collins and I are working right now to craft strong bipartisan legislation that meets the national security priorities that the President laid out. That means a package that provides support to the Ukrainians who are at, are at a crucial point in their fight to protect their sovereignty and the end of the butchery of Vladimir Putin's brutal invasion. One that makes clear to other countries looking to cop, 
copy Putin's aggression, that they will fail, and one that replenishes DOD stockpiles as well and bolsters our domestic manufacturing. That is crucial to ensure we have secure supply chains when it comes to our nation's defense and that after we send Ukraine weapons, we are replacing our stocks with modern American-made arms. And let's be clear, huge supermajorities in the House and Senate favor more support for Ukraine. So getting this funding across the finish line should not be controversial. Meeting this moment also means a package that ensures we stand with Israel as it works to protect its people in the wake of the horrific Hamas attack and deter additional terrorist threats, and one that helps us prevent further escalation of violence in the region and address humanitarian needs. It means a package that strengthens our presence and supports our allies in the Indo-Pacific and helps us keep pace as the Chinese government works aggressively to expand its footprint in the region. And of course, it also means a package that continues our long-standing and all-important tradition of the U.S. leading the global humanitarian response and delivering vital humanitarian aid to save lives in places that are being torn apart by conflict. Whether they are in Ukraine or Israel or Gaza, we cannot lose sight of the needs of civilians whose lives have been appended by war and violence around them. Making sure people have food, water, and medical care isn't just the right and moral thing to do, it also promotes long-term stability and security, combating hopelessness that can spiral into new threats. Let me also say this as someone who voted against the Iraq war. I have been heartened to see the President urge our allies in Israel not to fall subject to so many of the same mistakes we saw following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. It is an important message for the President and our country to deliver as a friend of Israel to stay clear-eyed and strategic in pursuit of justice. Every country has an obligation to protect innocent life and abide by international law, especially during times of conflict. I'm glad the Biden administration is sending that message, and I strongly support their robust efforts to ensure further access to humanitarian relief for the civilians of Gaza. Finally, make no mistake, we need to address all of these priorities as part of one package because the reality is these issues are all connected and they are all urgent. The Chinese government is watching how we respond to Putin's aggression in Ukraine. Putin is hoping the Hamas attack will give him an opening and distract the world from aiding Ukraine against his brutal invasion. And all of our adversaries are watching closely to see whether we have the vision to recognize how these crises are related and the resolve to come together and respond forcefully to them. Our adversaries are cheering for dysfunction. So let's instead show them unity. Let's show them the strength of democracy by passing a robust, bipartisan national security package. And before I turn it over to Vice Chair Collins, let me just say, while we are focused on the global challenges at this hearing, we should also address the needs here at home, the child care crisis, relief for our communities who've been struck by disaster, the fentanyl crisis, the needs at our southern border, and more. And I'm continuing to discuss a separate hearing to address those issues with my colleagues. I know that it's critical to many of us here, and next week we will have an opportunity to discuss these issues with Secretary May Mayorkas and Secretary Becerra at a hearing in front of this committee on November 7th. Bottom line, we face a number of urgent national security issues and challenges here at home. President Biden has submitted requests for much-needed supplemental funding to address these priorities. I urge my colleagues on both sides to work with me on all of these urgent issues. And if we can pass our domestic priorities right alongside our national security priorities, we absolutely should. After all, we are the United States of America. We can stand with our allies around the world and tackle the challenges facing our families here at home at the same time. Now, I'm glad we're holding this hearing today to discuss the vital national security request the President has submitted to Congress, and I look forward to a thoughtful discussion about what is needed to fight and deter aggression from authoritarian leaders, tackle terrorist threats, and protect so civilians, and about what is at stake for America's own security and future if we fail to stand with our friends across the globe and lead. 
Thank you. And with that, I will turn over to Vice Chair Collins. Thank you, Chair Murray, for holding this important hearing. Let me begin by expressing my appreciation to Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin for joining us today to discuss the President's National Security Supplemental Funding Request. I had hoped that Secretary Mayorkas also would be here, but he is testifying this morning before another Senate committee. I very much appreciate that the chair has scheduled an opportunity next week for Secretary Mayorkas to come before us and describe what is needed in the supplemental to provide effective border security to stem the flood of illegal migrants and fentanyl crossing into the United States. Through the end of fiscal year, as of September 30th, there were a record 2.5 million encounters at our southwest border. This real threat to our homeland must also be addressed. The collective threats that the United States faces from an aggressive Iran and its proxies, an imperialist Russia, and a hegemonic China are also challenges that require our attention and cooperation from our allies. Adversaries in the Middle East are launching attacks not only against our ally Israel, but also against American troops in Syria and Iraq. In Ukraine, the determined patriots backed by the United States, the European Union, Japan, Australia, and others continue to battle Putin's brutal and unprovoked invasion. In Asia, China's dangerous game of brinkmanship is targeting our aircraft flying in the region, rattling sabers at Taiwan, and physically challenging claims of the Philippines and Vietnam in the South China Sea. Some have argued for decoupling funding to address these threats and focusing only on the Iranian-backed terrorists who massacred so many Israelis on October 7th. We must recognize that our national security interests are being aggressively challenged by all these authoritarian actors in an effort to dismantle the international order that we established following World War II. Iran has been Russia's accomplice in Ukraine through the export of weapons and drones that terrorize Ukrainian civilians. Just last week, Russia hosted Hamas, an Iranian leadership, where Hamas praised Russia's criticism of Israeli's actions to defend itself following the recent terrorist attacks. China refuses to condemn either Russia's second invasion of Ukraine or Hamas's attacks, despite having, despite both having committed war crimes targeting civilians and both having stolen children from their families. If we fail to thwart these efforts, there will be dire consequences that will jeopardize our national security. The metric by which I will scrutinize the funding proposed by the administration's request is simple. Does it make America more secure or not? Let me offer a few reflections. When I was in Israel with Senator Graham, Senator Cardin, and several other senators last week, we met with families whose loved ones, including very young children, are being held hostage by Hamas. During the October 7th terrorist attacks, parents were murdered in front of their children. The actions of Hamas are nothing less than evil, and we must stand by our friend Israel, the only true democracy in the Middle East. Like Israel, Ukraine was the victim of an unprovoked attack by a repeat violent offender. 
the United States, albeit slower than many of us would have liked, stepped in with assistance for Ukraine to help repel Russia's battlefield advances. Let's review what has happened since we have helped Ukraine in its defense against Russia's second invasion. No U.S. soldiers have lost their lives fighting in Ukraine. Our adversary, Russia, is weaker. NATO is stronger than ever. Finland has joined the alliance, and I expect that Sweden will do the same soon. Each of these outcomes is in America's interest. Finally, the supplemental request includes more than $30 billion to replenish our military's weapons stockpiles and invest in and strengthen the U.S. defense industrial base in many states. The requested funding will refill the stockpiles and increase the production capacity of key munitions in greatest demand. None of this funding goes overseas or to another country. It makes America stronger by modernizing our arsenal of democracy right here in our country and improving the readiness of the U.S. military to deter any adversary seeking to harm the United States. Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin, we look forward to hearing your specific justifications. Before we turn to your opening statements, let me reiterate that Chair Murray and I want to enact all 12 appropriations bills, including the State Foreign Ops Bill and the Defense Appropriation. As former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates once told me, the most important action Congress can take to bolster our national security is to pass full-year appropriations bills to avoid the harm to military readiness that comes from short-term funding patches or sequestration. Secretary Austin, I hope that you will comment on that in your opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Collins. And before I introduce our witnesses and move to testimony, I want to take a moment to welcome someone else today, our newest member of the committee. Uh, Senator Sinema is someone who truly knows how to work with members on both sides of the aisle. I'm sure she will be a strong voice for our constituents. Welcome to our committee. Madam Chair, if I may echo your welcome to Senator Sinema. We've worked very closely on many bills, and I know she's going to be a great addition to our committee. Thank you. Um, now back to the business's hand. I'm very pleased to welcome Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Thank you both for taking the time today to be with us and to answer our questions. We will now start with opening remarks. And Secretary Blinken, I will begin with you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Murray, uh, Vice Chair Collins, uh, distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. I do, I do recognize that people feel very passionately, but I ask that we have order in this hearing room and respect our speakers. We will move forward with the hearing uh, and allow the people here and the American people to hear from their witnesses. Senator Blinken. Thank you, Chair. Uh, two and a half years ago, our adversaries assessed that the United States was becoming permanently divided at home, alienated from our allies and partners around the world. Working together, we've demonstrated that America's resilience its strength and leadership in the world remain unmatched. We've made historic investments in the source of America's strength at home, our democracy, our infrastructure, our economic and technological competitiveness. We've invested in the modernization of our military, and we've invested in our greatest strategic asset abroad, our network of allies and partners, which is growing larger, stronger, more united, and more capable than ever. 
We're standing up for our interests and values, not shrinking back. Not in the face of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Not in the face of an intensifying strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. If the witness will suspend, and I ask that everyone again respect this hearing, we will suspend until the room is cleared. Thank you, Senator Blinken. If you can continue, please. As I said, we're standing up for interests and values, not shrinking back, not in the face of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, not in the face of intensifying strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific and around the world, not in the face of terrorism and its state sponsors. And America does not stand alone. We built extraordinary coalitions with friends who carry their share of the burden, which I'm happy to come back to. Our adversaries and competitors alike recognize that our strategies are working, and they continue to do everything they can to disrupt us. We now stand at a moment where many are again making the bet that we're too divided or too distracted at home to stay the course. That's what's at stake with President Biden's National Security Supplemental Funding Request. The President's request would secure the urgent resources that we need to continue to lead. Secretary Austin and I believe it important for us to be here together today because in this mission, as in so much that we do to advance America's national security, our defense, our di di diplomacy, our development must work hand in hand. Committee will suspend. And again, I, I appreciate that people feel passionately about these issues. I would ask that you respect our witnesses and our committee members and allow the American people to hear their testimony. We will pause until the room is cleared. Thank you, Secretary Blinken. If you can continue, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the President's funding request has four key elements. First, it provides for our enduring support to Israel and Ukraine, two democracies under brutal assault by actors determined to wipe their nations off the map. It will ensure that Israel can continue to defend its people by building on the diplomatic, security, and intelligence support that the United States has surged since Hamas's appalling slaughter. I know that several... The committee will suspend, and I again ask that those in the audience respect the people in the room and allow us to continue the hearing. The hearing will suspend until the uh, disruption is removed. Thank you, Secretary Blinken. If you can continue, please. So I was saying, I know that several committee members have traveled to Israel over the last three weeks. They've heard directly from Israeli officials what they need to defend their people and prevent another attack like this one. And that's exactly what the supplemental provides, with $3.7 billion for security needs, including to help Israel bolster its air and missile defense systems. The supplemental also requests additional authority to draw down DOD stocks and enhances the security of our embassy. As President Biden has made clear from the outset, while Israel has the right, indeed it has the obligation, to defend itself, the way it does so matters. In our discussions with the Israeli government, the President and I have both stressed the need for Israel to operate by the rule of... Committee will suspend. Secretary Blinken, you may continue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I was saying the President and I have both stressed in our conversations with the Israeli government the need for Israel to operate by the law of war and in accordance with international humanitarian law and to take all possible measures to avoid civilian casualties. For Ukraine, 
President Biden is requesting $16.3 billion to supply Ukraine's defense, without which Russia will move quickly to try to seize and exploit any possible opening, and to ensure that Ukraine can sustain the economic base and recovery that its war effort depends on. This funding will not only re rebuild Ukraine's economy and offset the damage wrought by Russia, but it will also help to reimagine it, investing in new industries, infrastructure, and supply chains connected to Europe and to the world. Secure and resilient clean energy, anti-corruption bodies, civil society, media. To be strong enough to deter and defend against aggressors beyond its borders, Ukraine needs a resilient economy and a vibrant democracy within its borders. Since Russia lost its war, the robust funding supported by Congress has enabled the people of Ukraine in their courageous fight to defend their nation. It's helped make sure that Russia's invasion and strategic Committee will suspend. Thank you. And before I turn back over to you, Secretary Blinken, I just really want to thank the Capitol Police for their very calm and professional manner. We all appreciate it. Secretary Blinken, can you thank please you. continue? Thank you. So to continue, uh, since Russia launched this war, the robust funding provided uh, by Congress has enabled the people of Ukraine in their courageous fight to defend their nation. It's helped make sure that Russia's invasion is a strategic debacle, making it weaker in nearly every way. And it's rallied the world in defense of Ukraine and of the principles at the heart of the United Nations Charter, sovereignty, territorial independence, integrity, excuse me, and independence. Our partners are making significant contributions to share the burden of assistance. Turning our backs on their efforts would have lasting implications for our own security and our own standing in the world. The conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East have clear links, as both uh, the chair and vice chair have noted. Since we cut off Russia's traditional means of supplying its military, it's turned more and more to Iran for assistance. In return, Moscow has supplied Iran with increasingly advanced military technology, which poses a threat to Israel's security. Allowing Russia to prevail, with Iran's support, will simply embolden both Moscow and Iran. Second, this funding will enable us to tackle grave humanitarian needs created by autocrats and terrorists, as well as by conflict and natural disasters in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Sudan, in Armenia, and other places around the world. Food water, medicine, other essential humanitarian assistance for civilians must be able to flow into Gaza. Civilians must be able to stay out of harm's way. 
a task that's made even more difficult as Hamas uses civilians as human shields, and humanitarian pauses must be considered. Helping prevent a worsening humanitarian catastrophe aligns with our nation's most deeply held principles, including our belief that every civilian life is equally valuable, equally worthy of protection. Without swift and sustained humanitarian relief, the conflict is much more likely to spread. Suffering will grow, and Hamas and its sponsors will benefit by fashioning themselves as the saviors of the very desperation that they created. Humanitarian assistance is also vital to Israel's security. Providing immediate aid and protection for Palestinian civilians in this conflict is a necessary foundation for finding partners in Gaza who have a different vision for the future than Hamas and who are willing to help make it real. Third, this funding is critical to outcompeting our strategic rivals. This request will bolster deterrence. It will support our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific to address threats from an increasingly assertive PRC and to meet emerging challenges. It will uphold our commitment to our allies, including under our trilateral security partnership with Australia and the United Kingdom, AUKUS. And it will help countries transition to military and defense equipment that's made in America. The President's request also include resources for the World Bank and International Monetary Fund to provide alternatives to China's coercive financing for our partners in the developing world. It will also help ease the impact of spillovers of Russia's war on food and energy security for the world's most vulnerable. The proposed $2 billion appropriation and requested authorizations would generate almost $50 billion in additional development funding capacity for the World Bank and the IMF, an enormous return on our investment, demonstrating U.S. leadership in meeting urgent global challenges. Fourth and finally, the supplemental will make critical investments to protect the security of Americans here at home. That includes addressing the hemispheric challenge of irregular migration, strengthening our defense industrial base to ensure our military continues to be ready, capable, and the best equipped fighting force in the world, and that we remain the arsenal for democracy. More than $50 billion of the security assistance funding will replenish U.S. military stocks, strengthen our defense industrial base, and will be spent through American businesses. Each of these investments work together to achieve our mission, a stronger, safer, brighter future where America can lead from a position of strength. Let us come together and demonstrate to one another and to the world that we can rise to this moment. I also hear very much the passions expressed in this room and outside this room. All of us are committed to the protection of civilian life. All of us know the suffering that is taking place as we speak. All of us are determined uh, to see it end. Uh, but all of us know the imperative of standing up with our allies and partners when their security, when their democracies are threatened. That's what's happening now. We stand resolutely with them, even as we stand resolutely for the protection of innocent civilians. Before I close, I'd just like to thank senators for their vote today to send the President's ambassadorial nominee, Jack Lew, to Israel at this critical time. And I encourage the Senate to do the same for the 26 other nominees waiting for their vote. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Secretary Blinken. Uh, Secretary Austin, if you want to begin your testimony, please. Act, uh, if you could suspend until we have the room cleared. Thank you. Secretary Austin, you may begin. Chair Murray, uh, Vice Chair Collins, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to discuss our urgent need for supplemental funding to strengthen our national security. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists murdered more than 1,400 Israelis and at least 36 Americans and took more than 200 hostages. It was the deadliest terrorist attack in Israel's history. It was cruel, hateful, and repugnant. And as former head of Central Command, it reminded me powerfully of the crimes committed by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. As President Biden has said, any democracy would respond decisively to such a vile terrorist assault. And I traveled to Israel just days after the attack to underscore America's ironclad commitment to Israel's security. 
Now, we fully understand that Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people, and we mourn the loss of Palestinian civilians. And I have repeatedly made clear to Israel's leaders that protecting civilians in Gaza is both a moral responsibility and a strategic imperative. Democracies like ours are stronger and more secure when we uphold the law of war and protect civilians. Now, tensions remain exceptionally high. So let me outline the department's four key lines of effort. First, we'll continue to protect American forces and citizens in the region. Our personnel have come under repeated attack in recent days by Iranian-backed militia groups, and these attacks must stop. At the president's direction, U.S. forces have conducted precision self-defense strikes on facilities in eastern Syria used by Iran's IRGC and its affiliates. If Iranian-backed groups continue to attack U.S. forces, we will not hesitate to take further necessary measures to protect our people. We've also raised force protection measures across the region, and I have deployed a terminal high-altitude area defense battery, as well as additional Patriot batteries. And second, we're flowing security assistance into Israel at the speed of war. We're providing air defense capabilities precision-guided munitions, small-diameter bombs, and other key equipment, including more interceptors for the life-saving Iron Dome system. Third, we're coordinating closely with Israel to help secure the release of every man, woman, and child seized by Hamas, including American citizens. As President Biden told the families of the missing Americans, we have no higher priority than the safe return of their loved ones. And we immediately provided U.S. military advisors to offer, our, offer best practices for integrating hostage recovery into Israel's operations. And finally, we swiftly strengthened our force posture in the region to deter any state or non-state actor from escalating this crisis beyond Gaza. Two carrier strike groups are now in the region. Last week, an additional F-16 squadron, squadron arrived in the region, complementing other fighter squadrons already in theater. And all this underscores the President's clear warning. No government or group that wishes Israel harm should try to widen this, this crisis. Yet even as we surge support into Israel, we remain focused on Ukraine. Nearly 20 months into Putin's failed campaign of conquest, the Russian military has been badly weakened. Ukraine's brave forces have taken back more than half of the territory seized by Russian invaders since, since February 2022. And that was made possible by bipartisan and principal U.S. leadership and our coalition of some 50 allies and partners. In both Israel and Ukraine, democracies are fighting ruthless foes who are out to annihilate them. We will not, not let Hamas or Putin win. Today's battles against aggression and terrorism will define global security for years to come. And only firm American leadership can ensure that tyrants and thugs and terrorists will, will ride are not emboldened to commit more aggression and more atrocities. So our actions today will shape the world that our children and grandchildren inherit. And that's why we've submitted an urgent supplemental budget request to help fund America's national security needs and to stand by our partners and to invest in our defense industrial base. We're requesting $10.6 billion to help Israel defend itself. The supplemental also requests $44.4 billion to help Ukraine continue to defend itself against Russia's ongoing aggression. We're also requesting $3.3 billion to meet U.S. military requirements in our submarine industrial base and to fulfill our AUKUS requirements. Now, this supplemental doesn't just help meet today's urgent challenges. It also invests in our defense industrial base. When we send our friends munitions from our stockpiles, the money to replenish our supplies strengthens our military readiness and we invest in American industry and American workers. That also holds true for funding for Israel or Ukraine to procure new equipment off the production line. 
Some $50 billion of this supplemental request would flow through our defense industrial base, creating American jobs in more than 30 states. And these investments will also improve our production capacities far into the future and help ensure that we are ready to tackle security challenges worldwide. And all that means greater prosperity at home and greater security around the globe. And finally, let me thank all of you for your leadership. Your bipartisan support ensures that we can defend America and stand by the allies and partners who magnify our strength. I'm also deeply committed to working with all of you to enact a full year appropriation bill to keep America secure. As President Biden has said, American leadership is what holds the world together. And if we fail to lead, the costs and threats to the United States will only grow. We must not give our friends, our rivals, or our foes any reason to doubt America's resolve. So I look forward to continuing to work with you to keep America secure, prosperous, and strong. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Austin. We will now begin a round of five-minute questions of our witnesses, and I ask our colleagues to keep track of your clock. Stay within those five minutes. We have a lot of urgent challenges, getting aid to Israel as soon as possible, continuing our support for Ukraine, and addressing urgent humanitarian needs globally. Some of my colleagues in the House and a few in the Senate are pushing to provide only the emergency military funding for Israel and not the rest of the President's request in this security supplemental. Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin, I would like each of you to address this question. Why is it so important that we provide supplemental funding for Ukraine, the Indo-Pacific, and humanitarian assistance in addition to military aid to Israel? And Se Secretary Blinken, I'll begin with you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think it's very important to understand that the elements of this request work together as a package. Um, as you know, the defense industrial base operates in a complex way. Um, it's an interdependent unit. Making these investments together allows us to do what's needed to strengthen the defense industrial base and to seize the benefits and efficiencies that come from making these investments together rather than making them piecemeal. Um, we also know, as you've heard, that increasingly Russia and Iran are working together to challenge our leadership, uh, to hem us in globally, uh, to pose a growing threat uh, to our own security as well as to that of our allies and partners. They've been partners in a devastating war in Syria, uh, and now we have Iranian proxies firing missiles from Syria in northern Israel. Russia could stop this, but it doesn't. Instead, to the contrary, its government is hosting Hamas uh, for talks in Moscow. Iran is sending UAVs to Russia to attack Ukrainian civilians. So we're seeing the profound connections here. What happens in Ukraine, what happens in the Middle East also matters for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, beyond Europe, we know that our allies, as well as our adversaries, as well as our competitors, are watching that conflict. They're watching our response. The global impacts of Russia's unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine further stress the importance of ensuring that the Indo-Pacific does not learn the wrong lessons from these conflicts. So the funding request that we put before you is vital to securing a free and open Indo-Pacific in the face of mounting challenges in that region to threaten to undermine the international rules-based order, including things like freedom of navigation. Uh, in other words, to put it succinctly, for our adversaries, uh, be they states or non-states, um, this is all one fight. And we have to respond in a way that recognizes that. If we start to peel off pieces uh, of this package, they'll see that, they'll understand that we are playing whack-a-mole uh, while they cooperate increasingly and pose uh, an ever greater threat to our security as well as for that of allies and partners. And one final thing. I think when it comes to the humanitarian assistance, and we can come back to this, it's first and foremost vital because this is who we are. We know that when it comes down to it, uh, in each and every one of these conflicts, people are suffering. Men, women, and children. Parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents. And I think it's profoundly who we are to want to do everything we can to assist them, to try to lift some of the horrific burden that they're bearing from being caught in the midst of conflict. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's vitally important as a strategic proposition that we provide the assistance that we can uh, to help people in need. 
Um, we've seen Hamas and other groups play the siren song of nihilism to try to attract people to their perverted cause. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a better response, that we have a better answer across the board. That's part of the strategic proposition, as well as one that's profoundly humanitarian. Thank you. Mary Austin. Uh, thanks, Chair Murray. Um, I, I think it's important to remind ourselves that what happens in Ukraine and what happens in Israel matters not to just Ukraine and Israel. It, rem it matters to us. It affects our national security uh, as well. We also have to remind ourselves that these countries are in a fight. They're fighting every day, and there are people dying every day. And in Ukraine, Putin continues to attack civilians uh, and commit war crimes that are, that are despicable. And so these, these countries need, uh, urgently need the, uh, the resources to ensure that uh, they can continue to defend their sovereign territory. You know, in Ukraine, Putin has felt that he could wait us out. And that's part of his strategy, his ma his, the main part of his strategy. He feels that the West will get tired of, uh, of supporting Ukraine, and he'll soon have his way. If that's the case, if we don't support Ukraine, then Putin wins. But Putin will not stop in Ukraine. We know that. We all know that. And so I think it's important to do what's necessary to support Ukraine and Israel and to help them defend their sovereign territory. But as the Secretary said, as Secretary Blinken said, this is also an investment in our defense industrial base. Uh, it helps us re replenish our, our stockpiles and gives us additional depth and agility that helps us do what we have done over the years, over the centuries, over the uh, decades, excuse me, uh, around the world. And so I think this is very important that we provide the support and it's important that we provide the support now to both in both cases. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And if my committee members will indulge me, I just want to ask Secretary Blinken on the $10 billion in humanitarian assistance. Um, some of my colleagues have raised concern that that could end up in the wrong hands, including Hamas. Can you just walk the committee through the reason why you requested it and how you are confident that if aid is provided in places like Gaza, it will not end up in the hand of terrorists? Thank you very much. First, let's be clear that uh, the needs are desperate. Uh, the needs for the most basic things, food, water, medicine, fuel, uh, all of these are literally a matter of life and death, uh, just to focus in on, on Gaza. And we know um, that they are running out. Uh, hospitals don't have the fuel they need to operate. Um, men, women, and children displaced, well, well over a million people displaced in Gaza. Uh, about half of them under the care of, uh, of UNRWA right now, um, desperately need uh, the most basic things in order to survive. So from day one, uh, we have been working with uh, the Israeli government, with Egypt, with the UN agencies, as well as with other actors to try to make sure that assistance could get into people who need it in Gaza, but get in in a way that doesn't go to the people who don't need it, and that's Hamas. So we've set up a system where Assistance is coming through uh, Rafah, uh, the gate between Egypt and Gaza. Um, the assistance is checked by Israel um, at a site that has been established to do that so that every truck that goes in is verified uh, by Israel as well as by uh, the Egyptian authorities. The trucks go in. These are UN trucks. They go in. They connect to other UN trucks on the other side of the, of the line in Gaza. These trucks then go to distribution facilities that are run by UN agencies. The supplies are then taken from those agencies to various points, to hospitals, to bakeries, because bread is critical, um, and to uh, other endpoints. Throughout this process, uh, we have a, an ability, uh, and others have an ability, to track where the assistance is going. Uh, we're then able to do um, monitoring on the other end by contacting the designated recipients to ensure that it's actually gotten uh, to where it's supposed to go uh, and not been uh, diverted. To date, uh, we don't have reports either from uh, the UN uh, or from Israel that this assistance has been uh, diverted 
uh, from its intended recipients. But it's something that we're going to track very closely. Can I promise that you in this committee that there'll be 100% uh, delivery to the uh, designated recipients? No. Um, there will inevitably be some spillage. We haven't seen it to date, but I think we have to anticipate that. But the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of the assistance thus far is getting to people who need it, and we need more. Um, we've gotten up to uh, over 50 trucks a day before the conflict in Gaza, before Hamas's aggression against Israel uh, and its response. Uh, the UN and other agencies and other uh, uh, organizations providing relief we're sending in between uh, 500 and 800 trucks a day. Right now, we're up to almost 60. We're trying to get to 100 this week. That is the bare minimum uh, of what's needed, but we've got to do it, and we believe we have mechanisms in place to make sure that that assistance gets to people who need it, not to Hamas. Thank you. Vice Chair Collins. Secretary Blinken, let me follow up on Chair Murray's question. Does Israel agree that there are sufficient safeguards to prevent humanitarian aid from being diverted to Hamas rather than reaching the innocent civilians whom we all want to assist? Uh, yes, Vice Chair, and this is something that we've worked closely with Israel as well as with other actors involved. Uh, and as I said, the assistance that's going in from Egypt into Gaza is first checked by the, uh, by the Israelis as well as by the Egyptians. And then, as I mentioned, we have some methods to track it to make sure it gets to where it's supposed to go. To date, uh, neither the Israelis nor the UN have said that uh, the aid has been uh, diverted, and we're in constant, almost daily contact with Israel to make sure that the process we've established is working and also to find ways to expand it. Uh, one of the areas where we do need to do more and do need to do better is particularly with fuel, because hospitals need fuel to run. Uh, desalination plants need fuel to operate. This is an area where we're, we're working to find a way forward that meets the needs, but also with the assurances that Hamas won't abscond with it. Secretary Austin, as you indicated in your opening remarks, Iranian-backed terrorist proxy groups in the region have launched numerous drone and rocket attacks against our forces, U.S. forces, in Syria and Iraq. According to press reports, there have been at least 20 such attacks, and 19 U.S. service members have been wounded. It's imperative that Iran and its proxy groups understand that they cannot attack American forces with impunity. I know that last week, President Biden ordered two U.S. strikes against facilities in Syria used by Iranian proxies to threaten our troops. But the New York Times has reported over the weekend that Iranian-backed terrorists continue to attack U.S. forces in the region even after these airstrikes. Since these U.S. airstrikes apparently were, have not been sufficient to deter additional attacks on our troops by Iranian-backed proxies, what else is the department doing to stop attacks against American troops? Well, thanks, Vice Chair. Uh, first of all, let me um, emphasize that the protection the safety of our troops and our civilians is of utmost important to me and of utmost important to the, to the president as well. Uh, we've taken a number of steps to make sure that uh, we increase our force protection posture. Uh, we've deployed a number of assets into the region as, uh, as well. Uh, we've been clear, the president's been clear, and I, and I have been clear, uh, Vice Chair, that uh, if that, if this doesn't stop, then we will respond. And so uh, we remain, we, we maintain the, uh, the right to respond. We have the capability to do that. And we will respond at a time and place of our choosing. Secretary Blinken, Israel has every right to defend its citizens from Hamas, including seeking out the terrorists in Gaza and destroying them, while also trying to minimize civilian casualties. There is a critical distinction here. Hamas targeted civilians. They kidnapped 
innocent children as well as people as old as 85 years old. Israel is not doing that. As Israel has begun to respond in Gaza to Hamas's indiscriminate and barbaric targeting of innocent Israeli citizens, some, and we've heard it today, have called for a ceasefire. A ceasefire would be a strategic victory for Hamas. It would simply allow Hamas to bide its time and prepare for future attacks and pay no price for the greatest loss of Jewish lives in a single day since the Holocaust. Could you clarify the administration's position on a ceasefire? Uh, first of all, Senator, I fully agree with you that no country, no country could tolerate uh, what Israel suffered on October 7th. And it's extraordinary the extent to which that day uh, has receded in memory uh, for, for so many. I was in Israel shortly after the, uh, the attack. Um, I've been going to Israel professionally for 30 years and longer than that uh, in my own life. And I have never seen what we uh, have all seen and what Israel experienced on that day in terms of the impact that it has on that society, almost to a man, woman, uh, and, and child. Uh, and as we know, um, it wasn't just the uh, attack itself and the vulnerability that, that it revealed. It was the nature of the attack uh, with young people chased down and gunned down at a, at a dance party with, as you said, children executed in front of their parents, parents executed in front of their children, um, families in a final embrace burned alive, people beheaded. I could go on. You've seen the pictures. You've seen the video. I've heard from many eyewitnesses to these atrocities, including, and if you'll forgive me, because, again, these stories recede so quickly, uh, a family at its breakfast table at one of the kibbutzes. And by the way, the profound irony of attacks on kibbutzes, the very people who most ardently believe and want a future of peace between Israelis and Palestinians, a future of two states. Uh, a family of four, a young boy and girl, six and eight years old, and their parents around the breakfast table. The father, his eye gouged out in front of his kids, the mother's breast cut off, the girl's foot amputated, the boy's fingers cut off before they were executed, and then their executioners sat down and had a meal. That's what this society is dealing with. And no nation could tolerate that. And as we've said repeatedly, as President Biden has repeatedly made clear, Israel has not only the right, but the obligation to defend itself and to try to take every possible step to make sure this doesn't happen again. We've been equally clear that it is vitally important how Israel does this. And the imperative of doing everything possible to protect civilians, as well as to care for those who are endangered by the conflict, is something that we feel strongly. Um, you're, of course, right that this is a special burden on Israel because Hamas cynically and monstrously puts intentionally civilians in harm's way by hiding behind them, by using them as human shields, by placing its people, by placing its equipment, uh, by placing its ammunition, uh, its uh, weapons, its command posts, underneath hospitals, underneath schools, in residential complexes. But for each of us, and particularly for democracies like Israel and the United States, we have to bear the burden of doing everything we possibly can to ensure that civilians uh, are not harmed and to care for those who need our help. When it comes to a ceasefire, in this moment, you're exactly right. Uh, that would simply consolidate what Hamas has been able uh, to do uh, and allow it uh, to uh, remain where it is and potentially repeat what it did another day. And that's not tolerable. Uh, no nation would tolerate it. We do believe that uh, we have to consider things like humanitarian pauses to make sure that assistance can get to those who need it and that people can be protected and get out of harm's way. But we can't have a, a situation where there's a reversion to the status quo, where when this is over, 
it goes back to Hamas being responsible for the governance uh, and uh, so-called security uh, of Gaza, because that's simply an invitation to repeat what happened. And again, no nation would tolerate that. Th thank you. Senator Durbin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Six weeks ago, the um, Senate, on a bipartisan basis, gathered with President Zelensky in the old Senate chamber. It was an historic and memorable moment. Many things were said about the courage of the Ukrainian people, which were well deserved. But I recall one particular statement made by President Zelensky, which I'd like to ask you about this morning. He was asked about the course of the war and said the heroism of his people was, has been demonstrated over and over again. But he said, without the continued financial support of the United States and NATO, we will lose this war. He was unequivocal. He repeated it. Without the financial support of the United States and NATO, we will lose this war. Secretary Austin, was he exaggerating? He was not, uh, Senator. Uh, as you know, we have uh, uh, provided significant amounts of security assistance to, uh, to Ukraine. And not only that, based upon our leadership, our example, some 50 other countries uh, have come in and, and worked with us in a coalition to also provide uh, assistance. And so they provided some $35 billion uh, of their own to this, uh, this overall effort. And I think our leadership in this, uh, in this effort really, really matters. Secretary Blinken, we know why we're asking these questions. The proposals coming from the new Speaker of the House suggest that he would fund the support for Israel requested by the administration, but not fund the support for Ukraine. In the starkest terms, what would that mean if we were to step back and not fund support for the people of Ukraine to repel Putin at this moment? Senator, I think it would do uh, both uh, terrible harm to our, our, our values, but also to our core interests. Values because I think all of us are united in wanting to respond to uh, aggressors, to bullies who try to lord it over, over their neighbors. And in the um, midst of doing that, uh, inflict incredible suffering uh, on people. What impact but will it ha would that have on NATO? I'm sorry? What impact would it have on NATO if the United States does not Well, I'd say support? two things. First. Um, what we've seen is a remarkable coming together of, uh, of our NATO alliance, an alliance that's actually grown stronger and uh, larger as a result of Putin's aggression, um, an alliance that's also stepped up in a major way. It's individual members in terms of burden sharing. We often and rightly have concerns in, uh, in different conflicts in the past about uh, inadequate burden sharing. Uh, this is an instance where we've seen very significant burden sharing that uh, would, would almost certainly go away if we go away. Uh, if you look at it, total assistance to Ukraine going back to February of 2022, the United States has provided about $75 billion, our allies and partners, $90 billion. If you look at budget support, the United States has provided about $22 billion during that period, allies and partners, $49 billion during that period. Military support, we provided about $43 billion, allies and partners, $33 billion. Humanitarian assistance, the United States, $2.3 billion, allies and partners, $4.5 billion plus another 18 to 20 billion in caring for the many refugees who went uh, to Europe uh, and outside of Ukraine. So I think what this, the, the message it would send, uh, first of all, uh, to each and every one of these countries is if the United States is abandoning ship, well, we may as well do, do too. I don't and second, our alliance itself uh, is founded on the proposition that we're all in this together. Uh, I think they would see this as a retreat from our own responsibilities. Finally, and this is very important, um, and you heard the Secretary of Defense say this. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that if Putin is allowed to continue to act with uh, impunity, that not only would he not stop uh, at Ukraine and potentially go to a NATO country next, which would invoke our Article 5 obligations to our allies and partners, it would send a message to would-be aggressors everywhere in the world that if he can get away with it, so can we. And then we're likely to have a world full of conflict, and that's a world that's not good for the United States. We are much better sustaining our effort now seeing this to success than having to pay a much higher price later when we Mr. have to deal Secretary, with a world full of aggression. Mr. Secretary, it can't be a coincidence that Putin would invite the head of the Hamas terrorist organization to Moscow just days after the October 7th attack, the miser terrible max massacre which you described in some detail, and I've heard so many depictions. So do you believe there is a, an allied effort between Putin's cause and the cause of the Hamas terrorists? Uh, Putin is very much trying to take advantage of the 
Hamas attack on Israel in the hopes that it will distract us, uh, that it will uh, divert our focus away from Ukraine and away from his aggression in Ukraine, uh, and that it will result in uh, the United States pulling back, pulling back its resources, pulling back its support. Uh, and at the same time, he's allied with uh, the exact uh, elements uh, that are trying to wreak havoc um, uh, in Israel. So we see these things as being very much joined, which is one of the reasons our request is a joint request. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Graham. Thank you. <clears throat> Secretary Blinken, thank you very much for helping us, uh, the 10 of us who went over to Israel and Egypt and, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, just to kind of tighten things up a little bit, from an Israeli point of view, there will be no ceasefire until Hamas ceases to be a threat to the state of Israel. Do you agree with that statement? I do. Okay. So no ceasefire until Hamas ceases to be a threat. Makes perfect sense to me. Um, do you believe it's the goal of Hamas to destroy Israel, not to have a two-state solution? Uh, don't have to take my word for it. Take Hamas's word for it. It's in I their charge. I couldn't agree with you. You agree with that, General Austin? I, I do. They have said so. All right. So we're fighting somebody who's not trying to help the Palestinians. They're trying to kill all the Jews. Would it be fair to say that Hamas is a modern-day version of religious Nazis? I think there are different ways to qualify it. I would simply say that what well, is we've that seen a, in recent, is that a good well, characterization? Recent, I think the best recent analogy, Senator, yeah. is ISIS. Is that okay with you for me to call them religious Nazis? I, I agree with Secretary Blinken. Uh, yeah. There's a direct parallel to ISIS. As a matter of fact, yeah. I think Okay, yeah, steps. well, that's right. ISIS, Nazis is all bad. Uh, we all agree with that. <clears throat> do you agree without Iran's help, Hamas could not do this? In short, yes, uh, yeah. there's no doubt that Hamas wouldn't be Hamas. As a matter of fact, General Austin, some estimates are that 93% of all the money Hamas receives comes from Iran. Is that correct? I don't know the exact percentage, but I would say the vast majority uh, does come from. Well, all the reports I've seen from the administration is 90%. So Hamas is ISIS, Nazis, whatever you want to call them. Um, they, they want to kill all the Jews. So if I were Jewish, I'd want to stop them. Uh, <clears throat> They're being supported by Iran. Uh, our troops in Syria and Iraq, they're there to protect against the rise of ISIS. Is that true, General Austin? Uh, that's right. They're I mean, they're just behind. not hanging out, no other place to go. They're there because it's in our national security interest that ISIS not come back. You agree with that? That's correct, sir. Okay. Is it a red line <clears throat> for Iran to orchestrate an attack on our forces that kills an American in Syria or Iraq. Is that a red line? Can we tell the Iranians today, in case they're watching, if an American is killed by your proxies in Syria and Iraq, we're coming for you. Can you say that? I think Iran should be held accountable for the activities of, uh, of these Iranian Okay, hey, does that mean that we would consider going to the source of the problem, the great Satan is Iran, not Israel, it's not the United States? Can we say publicly to the families who have service members over in Iraq and Syria that we will hit Iran if they try to kill an American through their proxies? Can we say that? What we have said and what we'll continue to say, uh, Senator, is that we're going to hold. Uh, uh, well, I wish you would be more clear because I'll tell you this. If one of these soldiers is killed, I'm going to say it, and I hope other people will join me. Uh, if there's a attack by Hezbollah in the north, uh, General Austin, that would put the state of Israel at threat, would that be an escalation of the war? It would be an escalation, and, and Israel would be forced to fight on two fronts. And I agree with that. And they have over 100,000 precision-guided rockets and missiles pointed at Israel. Is that correct? That's correct. Is it also correct that Iran is the biggest benefactor of uh, Hezbollah? That is absolutely correct. Can we say to Iran, the Ayatollah, who is a religious Nazi, that if you escalate the second front, if you activate Hezbollah against the state of Israel, 
to create a second front, we will come after you. Can we say that? Is that a red line? Whether or not we, uh, we attack uh, Iran because of a uh, decision uh, on a part of uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, that, of course, that's a well, presidential decision I, and also <coughs> a, uh, will require congressional I, I, I'm support. running out of time. I'm going to say it. If it happens, I hope it does it. Finally, do you agree with me, Secretary Blinken, that one of the main reasons this attack occurred is Iran wants to stop the reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Israel? Yes, those who are opposed to normalization are Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran. So I just want to end it with this. I will do everything I can as a Republican to help the Biden administration to achieve a reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Israel with the understanding we're going to help the Palestinian people post Hamas. That is the only way this ends. So I, con I congratulate you. I urge you to continue to drive toward peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Do not let Iran win by getting us off track. And General Austin, Austin, I admire you very much. But we need to be clear, crystal clear, as to what happens if Iran kills an American soldier or they open up a second front. And I hope you will let them know what our red lines are. Thank you. Senator Reid. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the first point I would like to raise is with respect to our colleagues in the House, their proposal, the Republican leadership, that not only do they not fund Ukraine, which I think your testimonies indicates is a vital imperative for the United States, they also want to offset the funding uh, by taking money from the IRS. Uh, obviously, I don't think they read the Wall Street Journal because just a few uh, days ago, the Wall Street Journal reported that uh, in 2021, the Americans failed to pay $688 billion in taxes. So if we don't invest in the IRS, we are giving up billions and billions of dollars. And I think that point has to be recognized uh, as we go forward and negotiate with the House. But let me turn now to the issue at hand. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, Secretary Austin sending resources to Ukraine. Uh, you are now uh, the Civilian Secretary of Defense, but you were a distinguished uh, Army officer and commander of CENTCOM. If we don't send the resources, does that increase the probability that someday we'll have to send young Americans into the European theater? Absolutely, uh, uh, Senator Reid. I think, uh, as we said earlier, if Putin is successful, he will not stop at Ukraine. And if you're a Baltic uh, state, you're, you're, you're thinking, I'm next. Uh, and, you know, there's no question in, in my mind that sooner or later, uh, there will be, uh, he will challenge NATO and we'll, want, we'll find ourselves uh, in a shooting match. And so in one sense, this comes down to a choice between lending them the tools to do the job or seeing young Americans facing combat. I agree, Senator. Thank you. Uh, again, Secretary Austin, uh, you pointed out with respect to uh, the efforts in Gaza that Humanitarian assistance is not just a good thing to do, it's a strategic necessity for the operations of Israeli forces. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Now, uh, it would seem to me that they could and should um, move into position in areas they control, hospitals, shelter, and food, and make it available to the Palestinian people and do all they can to assist those people to reach those uh, areas. Is that appropriate? Uh, absolutely, Senator. I, uh, and just so you know, uh, I talk to my counterpart, uh, Minister of Defense Gallant, uh, nearly every day. And, and every day I talk to him, I, I remind him of the necessity of getting humanitarian assistance uh, into, into Gaza. Uh, we just had such a conversation yesterday, and, and uh, this is really, really important for a number of reasons. But, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm delighted to see that the flow has increased, uh, but to the Secretary's point, uh, we need to increase it uh, much, much more. I think not only do we need to increase it, but also in terms of the strategy of the, the, the perception of the world with respect to Israel, is that they have to make it clear that their foe is Hamas, not the Palestinian people, and that they will go indeed out of their way to try to protect the Palestinian people. I think that's essential, and it's not just a humanitarian impulse. It's very practical, strategic uh, 
operational technique. I, I agree, sir. Uh, we tried to make this point also, Mr. Secretary, uh, Secretary Blinken, in our trips, uh, and we suggested uh, that to the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia that he can put resources into humanitarian relief. And I would urge you and your colleagues to try to get all of the nations in that area to provide the resources. The Israelis control the ground, they can control the operations, but the money for aid to uh, Palestinian people should come from the international community. Yeah, Senator, I very much agree with that. The United States, as it stands, is by far uh, the leading donor to the Palestinians. We're, uh, we provided $1.6 billion in assistance through various agencies to the Palestinians over the pendency of this, of this administration. And we would like to see uh, other partners, uh, other allies step up and do the same thing. That's something that we've um, been very clear about in our own conversations. And I really applaud uh, the members of this committee and others who've uh, been to the region recently and have been uh, pushing that as well. Just a final point, uh, my time is expiring. We have also a necessity to get many American citizens out of Gaza. And uh, uh, can you assure us that you're doing all you can to achieve that objective? Uh, we are, Senator. We're working on this every single day. We have um, about 400 American citizens and their family members, so it's uh, roughly 1,000 people. Uh, who are stuck in Gaza and want to get out. Um, I'm focused on this intensely. Uh, my entire department is as well, both in the region uh, and here. We're working with various parties to try to facilitate their departure from, from Gaza. The impediment uh, is simple. It's Hamas. Uh, we've not yet found a way to get them out uh, by whatever, through whatever place and by whatever means uh, that Hamas is not blocking. But we're working that with uh, intermediaries, um, we're working that to, uh, for them. There are also another roughly 5,000 third country nationals from other countries seeking to get out. Uh, so this is something that we're intensely focused on. We've been, we've, we've been in close communication as best we can with Americans who are stuck in, in Gaza. We've had about uh, 5,500 communications um, that we've initiated, uh, phone calls, emails, WhatsApp, uh, to be in touch with them, to try to guide them as best we can and to work for their um, ability to leave. Thank you very much, John. Senator Moran. Chairwoman, thank you very much. Uh, upon the congressional receipt of the president's request for this emergency supplemental, um, my first request was of our own committee leadership that we have this hearing. And I thank both of you for honoring that request. Uh, Congress has a constitutional responsibility to deal with the dollars that will be spent and I want this committee, as we should do, to treat that uh, in a significant and serious manner. I think a markup would be important, but I would certainly indicate that changes and in input from this committee and from Congress are required, one, to make the package better, and two, to make it more amenable toward passage by both the House and the Senate. I was originally and continue to be disappointed that Secretary Mayorkas is not with us, but I'm pleased to know that that is occurring next week. I want the committee and our witnesses in representation of the administration to know that there are many of us who believe our borders are our national security issue as well, that emergency supplemental financial aid should be included, but I also want you to know that we need the administration to work with us on policy changes, uh, the laws and policies at the border Financial support for changes at the border for additional personnel are insufficient, but we need a different uh, approach toward the push and pull of those people around the world who are seeking entry into the United States. I'm interested in seeing a package pass the Congress and be signed into law, but I want to make certain the administration knows that there are many members of Congress who are serious about the issues of national security uh, at our own borders. I want to ask a couple of questions and I'll submit more in writing, but I'd like an insurance, and maybe this comes from you, Secretary Austin, of a commitment. Um, I want to make certain that as we assist Ukraine, we are assisting Ukraine in a way that allows, allows them to succeed. I don't want this to be just a stalemate. 
I do not want Ukraine to have the dollars necessary not to lose. I want Ukraine, with our help and others, to have the opportunity with their capabilities, their own personnel, to win. What would be your response, Secretary Austin? Uh, my response would be, uh, my response is, Senator, that that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, if you go back to the beginning of this, uh, of this um, effort here, you know, all of us were saying, or many of us were saying, that Ukraine wouldn't survive Russia's onslaught for more than, a, than two days. Uh, so here we are a year later, and not only have they defeated uh, Russia in, uh, in a number of battles, uh, but they've gained, uh, regained 50 percent of the territory that Russia initially occupied. And Putin is a strategic fail failure right now. He's not achieved any strategic objective that he set out to achieve. He never conquered Kyiv. He, uh, he's been stuck essentially in the same place in terms of, you know, his frontline trace on the battlefield for a long time. Now, uh, I think that based upon where they started and, and where we are now and what they continue to do, I would say that Ukrainians have, done, have made remarkable progress. And our goal is to make sure that they can continue to do that. So we're talking to them every week. I'm talking to my counterpart every week uh, to – uh, ascertain what his uh, uh, requirements are, and we're moving with urgency to make sure that we can fill those requirements where possible. Secretary Austin, um, tell me, if you would, tell us, how does a failure to fund Ukraine embolden China, uh, embolden Iran, uh, embolden Hamas, embolden Russia? We've had circumstances in our history, including recent history, at least in my view, in which we sent a message to the world that we are not a faithful ally uh, and to our enemies, to our adversaries, that we are not a threat. Would the failure to fund Ukraine in this circumstance meet that criteria in which we fail to demonstrate our capabilities, our willingness, our state to it us? And what would be the consequences of that message being sent? As you know, there are those who say that we should be focused on someplace else besides Ukraine. But doesn't our failure to focus on Ukraine create huge and significant problems elsewhere in the world with our adversaries and diminish the support of our allies? Uh, I, I think it sends a, a horrible message to our adversaries, uh, Senator. I think, uh, you know, our adversaries would like to uh, build a narrative that uh, we are not a trustworthy uh, ally or, or a partner. And, uh, and we see some of that beginning to uh, play out in the, in the media space right now. Um, they are seeking to take uh, advantage of every opportunity. And they would like to prove that the United States is something else other than it is. And we are the world's most reliable ally or partner. And, uh, and I think it's, it's necessary to demonstrate that uh, we're going to stick by our partners. Is it more than coincidence that we have so many challenges in this world all occurring now at the same time? I, I think uh, a number of things have come together to cause what we're seeing happen, uh, but uh, certainly uh, a failure on our part to follow through uh, with, uh, with, you know, in support of our allies or partners exacerbates uh, some of the things that we're seeing right now. So. Thank you, sir.